It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord today, is it not? I trust that you all feel that way today. I certainly do. I'm glad to be here. We're going to be uh, examining God's Word today. That's, that's uh, no surprise to most of you. And we'll be in the uh, letter to the Ephesians that Paul wrote to the Christians who were in Ephesus. So we're in chapter 5, and we'll be narrowing down on verses 15 to 17. Uh, but we're going to read through verse 1 all the way to 17 as our preparation. So if I could, may I ask those of you that are healthy enough to go ahead and stand for the reading of God's infallible, inerrant, and holy word. As I said, we're going to begin by reading at verse 1 of chapter 5. Hear God's word. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved us and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But sexual immorality or impurity or greed must not even be named among you, as is proper among the saints, nor filthiness and foolish talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no one, sexually immoral or impure or greedy, who is an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of that light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And do not participate in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And now comes the portion for today's message, beginning at verse 15. Therefore, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. On account of this, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Thus far are the words of today's Holy Scripture. You may be seated. Let me repeat to you what Isaiah wrote for us. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God, surely that stands forever. As the gospel writers recorded, Jesus' own words are in harmony with that. Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So let me begin in prayer. Dear God, I do pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be found to be acceptable in your sight, because you alone are our rock and our redeemer. So God, open up your word to us today so that we will know exactly what you want us to do, what you want us to change, what you want us to keep, so that we can bring glory to you with every step that we take, every breath that we take. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. So now, last Lord's Day, we spoke about genuine believers in Christ being people of the light. When I was in college, there was a Christian group called Children of the Light. And I used to really like them right up until the fact that they started swapping wives and husbands and stuff. And then I wondered, what kind of light is that? Uh... We're looking at these people who were the light, and they had received a gift from God through grace, through no action of their own. And that's important for me to stress. Grace means no action of your own. One day, these people heard. They really, really heard the message of God's gospel. They awoke, and they heard and understood God's word. These same people opened 
their eyes and they began to see. Their lives were turned around forever. They became people who were being changed by God and his word into entirely different people. And didn't we hear this in Sunday school today about metamorphosis and the transformation that happens when our minds are renewed? These folks in Ephesus now march to the beat of a different drummer. Paul once wrote to his disciple Titus about this turnaround process that all genuine Christians undertake. So you should have this in your sermon outline. Listen as I read about the realities of the new Christian. This is in Titus 3, 1 to 8. Paul said, Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to be peaceable, considerate, demonstrating all gentleness to all men, for we ourselves also once were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice, in malice and envy, despicable, hating one another. But when the kindness and affection of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not by works which we did in righteousness, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we would become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed God will be intent to lead in good works. These things are good and profitable for men. Changed lives is what Christianity is all about. Changed lives are what we are to see when one is enlisted in God's army. Good works, they are not required for salvation. They are not conditions for salvation. If you're waiting to be good enough in order to join God's army, it's never going to happen. You have to have something happen to you like ears that finally hear, eyes that finally see. Those are gifts given to us in grace, not works. Good works will come. Yeah, as you're transformed, as your mind is renewed, good works will come. Because they are characteristics of salvation, not conditions for salvation. They're characteristics of it. Paul drives these truths home to us and to Titus in those eight verses. Let's go ahead now and look a little bit deeper into this way that we are to walk. And so in our text Therefore, what Paul wrote there was the pathway is not smooth. He knew, and we should know as well, when God calls his people to himself, he does not send them out ill-equipped. He tells them ahead of time that life as a Christ disciple is messy and bloody. He exhorts all genuine believers to engage in the fight. Now, sometimes in war, the soldier has the thankless task of clearing minefields from enemy territory. If you are aware of the procedure, you know the work that they do is dangerous and tedious. To proceed in an orderly fashion, the soldier must mark all the areas that are considered dangerous and the areas 
also that have been cleared. Above all, he must make sure that he is careful where he's walking. Well, that's just about where Paul is in Ephesians chapter 5. So let's look again at the text. Therefore, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. On account of this, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Now, in this particular passage that we're in, in Jan's language, this says, stop being stupid. Stop being stupid. And as we get to verse 18, it says, be being kept continually filled by the Holy Spirit. We'll get to that next week. But here, what we discover is he's saying, stop being stupid. The Greek word for stupid, no, never mind, never mind. (laughs) Therefore, look carefully how you walk. The Greek term for careful speaks of looking carefully from side to side, being alert to what is going on around you. We need to be extremely alert because the world we're walking through, I'm sorry, it's a minefield of sin and temptation. Therefore, we must walk carefully, exactly and accurately. The wise Christian carefully charts his course according to life principles designed by God. He doesn't trip over the obstacles that Satan puts in his path. He doesn't fall for the entanglement of the world's system. He's careful. He is not to overlook anything. In my parenting with our two boys, I told them many of my sins. Not all of them because I wanted them to not be there all day listening. (laughs) But I would say to them, now listen. I was not raised in a Christian home. The bar is a lot higher for you because you have God working with you. That's what we're talking about here. And the Greek word for walk is uh, peripateo. Peripateo. That sounds a little familiar to those of you that know English. We think of, oh, that sounds like peripatetic. Peripatetic is the, the way that we walk. And it infers a daily habit of uh, heart knowledge as well as head knowledge. This is a person who is pacing the perimeter, giving great attention and great concern. Paul is saying here in verse 15, if you used to be a fool, but you've been made wise in Christ, then walk wisely. Another way to say that is that we are to practice our position so that we live in accordance to who we really are in this new creation. When someone becomes a genuine Christian, they come out of foolishness and come into wisdom. I'm not going to say it happens overnight. It's only been about 40 years for me. Paul reiterates that we must not act the fool because we will surely step on Satan's landmines. One's uh, spiritual transformation absolutely demands that you live your life with the greatest of care. When my uh, dad graduated from West Point, he expected to get a a position on the field. And uh, what happened was that he ended up being diagnosed as a diabetic. Had it not been for a war going on, he, wouldn't have been, be sent, he would not have been sent anywhere. But he did get sent to Panama, and he had a, a touring show, so to speak, of what men were facing when they were in battle. 
My dad was responsible for showing people how to disable mines. And he said there were homes where he had to go in where the man had died trying to disable mines. He never got to the front lines. We want to be cautious in our walk, yes. And we want to make sure to know where we walk as well. In the, um, in the sport of fencing, um, you might hear one of the contestants uh, yelling out, on guard. That means be on your guard. There is not a time that you are not to be on guard. Uh, in our home, we have uh, a husband and a wife who sit under the dictates of a ruler. It's that dog. It's that dog, Barney. Barney is his name, and we have always wondered about one of his behaviors. When we let him out into the backyard, and he lets us know it's time for me to go into the backyard, he does it by this. He goes... <laughs> he does. He's like looking at us going, you bozos, I want to go out. Come on, come on. And then we let him out. What does he do? He's got to check the perimeter of the yard. He will immediately go out and go right to the fence. His breed, and he's kind of a terrier and a schnauzer, that's what they're supposed to do. That's what they do. They sniff out the perimeter of the yard before they let anybody else out. He wants to check up and to make sure that there are no intruders, intruders that, that uh, no one has come to that fence uh, since the last time that he checked the fence. There has to be no breaks in the line, no breaks in the fence. His nose is to the ground. He, he paces the entire perimeter of the yard. He is careful to do and to be thorough. So let me exhort you. Don't be stupid. Be like my dog. <laughs> there is not any time when he is going into our backyard that he is not on guard. Our text now explains redeeming the time. Therefore, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We are to be wise in redeeming the time. How can we make the most of our time on earth? How can we seize the opportunity? The word, incidentally, redeem, that's a famous word in our Bibles because this is exactly what Christ did with each one of his children. He purchased them with his blood out of the slave market of sin that this world represents. The word is ex agorazo. The agora was the marketplace. Ex means to move them out from there. That's what he did. Redeeming the time, incidentally, it doesn't mean chronological time. There are several words for time. That would be chronos. But he doesn't use chronos here. He uses kairos, which implies an era or an epoch of time, a season of time. Make the most of this window of opportunity that you have. Perhaps through uh, personal watchfulness, perhaps through self-denial, we are to buy back the present time that is now being used so often for godless purposes and even evil purposes. We are to buy back this era that we live in for the Lord. This text certainly says, don't be a fool. Paul says, but walk wisely. And why do we walk wisely? Because the days are evil. We have got to acknowledge opposition. The opponent is Satan. And I know in every church that I've ever preached, I know there are people here who do not believe in Satan. Get over it. He's in the Bible. Maybe you should pick up C.S. Lewis's book. Maybe you've heard me exhort you to pick up C.S. Lewis's book, 
the screw tape letters, what, you've heard, you say, heard me say it five times maybe, ten times? Pick it up. Read it. Don't be afraid of it. It could be true. It probably will give you eyeglasses with which to see the world. The days are evil? Yes. The, the Greek word here is ponerai. Ponerai, from which we get the word pornography. Greek word. L listen, uh, several years ago now, Dr. James Dobson, some of you are going to know that name, Dr. James Dobson, he started the organization called Focus on the Family. He was interviewing a, uh, I don't know what you say, uh, he, he was interviewing uh, a guy named Ted Bundy who was a, a serial killer, a mass murderer. And Ted Bundy, in this interview, said that his criminal life began on a downward moral spiral because of pornography. As a matter of fact, he indicated that all of the men presently on death row at that time had started with pornography. And Paul says, be wise. It is a very silly and naive Christian that does not believe in Satan. So what's the rationale for all this? Verse 17, on account of this, do not be foolish, but understand, oh, here we are, the title to our message today, understand what the will of the Lord is. Let's look at the negative side. He says, don't be foolish. Literally, don't get caught without cognition. Engage your brain, in other words. Don't be without a brain. Don't be without understanding. Don't be senseless. Don't be a total dolt. Don't be numb to the obvious around you. And what can we say about the positive? Well, first of all, let's remember, don't be a bozo, but understand that is the ability to bring things together and see them in relation to one another. God's people are always encouraged to make full use of their reasoning power. A wonderful author who's gone home to be with the Lord now, but his name was John Stott. He wrote several commentaries, many commentaries. He was the chaplain to the Queen of England while he was alive. He wrote a fascinating little book. Uh, I got a hold of it as soon as I became a Christian. Somebody recommended it to me, and it's called Your Mind Matters. Because don't people think Usually when, when you, they encounter a new young Christian, don't they think, oh, you'll get over it. You'll get over it. Or that's for idiots. Christianity is just for idiots. The Westminster Confession of Faith mentions the decrees of God. And if you've been here long enough, you know, I react hardly, harshly to that uh, because I tell you that God doesn't have decrees. He just has a decree, just one, and, and that is his purpose, his plan. It's not changing from day to day or anything like that. It's only one, and it has always been only one. What is the purpose or the plan of God? It is to redeem his people. So let me share with you now exactly how a Christian can walk wisely and know the will of God for his life. The will of God is explicitly revealed to us in the pages of Scripture. Amen. Nothing is like the Bible. No book is like the Bible. So first and foremost, go there. The will of God is explicitly revealed in the pages of Scripture. God's will is revealed in his word. Let me give you God's will for your life and for my life. And it's going to be six S's. Six S's. 
it is that first we ought to be saved. We must be saved. 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4 says, This is a good and acceptable thing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men, and that's all elect, all chosen to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And again in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some consider slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any of you, any of the elect, to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Yes, God's will for his people is that they be saved. And also that they be spirit-filled. That's the second S there, the spirit-filled. Don't be foolish, and understand, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But instead, he says, be filled with the Spirit. Next is sanctified. This is the will of God, your sanctification. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. What does God want? Your sanctification. And then saved, yes. Spirit-filled, yes. Sanctified, yes. And submissive. Scripture says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God. 1 Peter 2, 13 to 15. And then we are to, and you're not going to like this, we are to be involved in suffering for his sake. 1 Peter 3 says, It's better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than for doing what is wrong. And finally, the saying of thanks. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now at this point you may say to me, um, Jan, those are good principles. But they don't tell me where I ought to go to school next or who I should marry. Now let's be clear on this. But if you are saved, spirit-filled, sanctified, submissive, suffering for Christ and saying thanks, you can do whatever you want. That's what the psalmist meant in Psalm 37 when he said, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the treasures of your heart, the desires of your heart. Does that mean that he will fulfill every desire? Yes. I know you're thinking no. But the answer is yes. He fulfills it. Because he puts it in your heart. If you're living a godly life, he will give you the right desires and then fulfill them. So, in closing, let's talk a little bit more about knowing God's will, shall we? How do I know it? You are accountable now that you have heard this lesson. By God's enabling, you are to consistently apply these divine principles and truths to your life. So look at Philippians 2. Uh, verses 12 and 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. In 1 Timothy 4, 7, 9, 7 to 9, but refuse godless myths fit only for old women. On the other hand, train yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily training is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise of the present life and also for the life to come. It is a trustworthy saying and deserving full acceptance. And listen to the Lord's half-brother, James, in James 1, 22. But become doers of the word, and not hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, He's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror, 
For once he looked at himself and has gone away, he immediately forgot what kind of a person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of freedom, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks himself to be religious while he's not bridling his tongue, but deceiving his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this. Visit the orphans, visit the widows in their affliction, keep oneself unstained by the world. And then let me exhort you to meditate on this passage. Ask yourself these simple questions. How does God want my beliefs or actions to change? And then next, how can I accomplish this change? And then next, what's the very first step that you can initiate toward bringing about this change? Amen? Amen. Let me pray. Dear God, that's what we ask. We ask for you to be guided, guiding us in your ways so that we don't uh, hit the guardrails too hard. So that we, we don't want to live as other people live. But we know that your people are separated, that you want them to be holy and blameless, and that you actually will equip us for those battles to come. So God, help us to, to examine our lives, to, to look in the dark corners, to find the things that we don't want to give up, and then and then ask, Lord, why we can't, and ask again, will you give us the power to forsake these? So, Lord, do what your word says. Would you, would you renew our minds? For it's in your name we pray. Amen.